nervous moment when we wait to see if anyone's actually going to come. Well, at least the weather doesn't put them off. That's true. So welcome, everybody. I can see um, the number of people in the room is growing exponentially. Um, we've got about, uh, I think we're expecting around about uh, 400 of you. So I'm just going to let this number keep ticking up uh, until it looks like everybody's in the room. Uh, so yeah, thanks for um, coming along and joining us uh, tonight. Um, thanks as well if you if you uh, had to put up with the, the the slight change in time uh, for this event as well. It looks like the it looks like the message managed to reach everybody uh, about the about that that change in time. So that's great. Um, so yeah, it looks like most people are in in the room now. So uh, my name is Rory. I, uh, I'm the Scottish Wildlife Trust's uh, communications officer. Uh, I was just going to introduce a couple of bits of housekeeping. Um, first of all, a reminder that this uh, talk this evening is going to be recorded um, and it'll be shown uh, on our website uh, alongside uh, other, other recordings, which you can now find a growing number of uh, online. Um, please do, if you have any questions for Tom during the talk, please post those in the Q&A. Um, we'll have a bit of a question time uh, towards the end of the talk um, and we'll try and answer just as many questions as we can. Uh, if you have any other comments, um, please post them in the chat box. Uh, we'd ask as well that you avoid posting any, any links uh, in that chat box um, just for folks' peace of mind and security. Uh, and without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Leslie uh, to introduce the evening talk. Hello. <laughs> Um, I'm Leslie Hawkins, I'm Secretary of the Calendar Log Group. So I think the first thing to do is apologise to the Chairman, Kevin Duffy, he couldn't actually be here tonight because he's, uh, he's out in the field getting wet most days uh, and working away from home. So the only other thing I'd add to what Rory said was um, when your questions are being posted, if there's one that's a question you're very interested in or you were going to ask anyway, if you like it, that will actually push those questions to the top of the list and we'll do those first. So that's quite useful, you can do that please. Um, so just a, a quick introduction to the calendar group. Um, of the 19 local groups, we're actually the second smallest, only bigger than Sky. Um, we've got 79 memberships and about 120 individuals within that. So we're based uh, in central Scotland um, 15 miles northwest of Stirling, which is our nearest uh, other local group, which is about 100 times bigger than we are, um, based on the southeast edge of Loch Lomden Matrosets National Park. So I always say we're very small, but we do live in one of the best areas. Um, originally, Calendar was the area of the town where the uh, group was set up. So that's the name that's, that stayed with it. But our members actually uh, cover quite a big distance from Dune, about eight miles south, where Argot is based, um, all the way up to uh, through the village of Strathaya, Locker, and head up to Killin. So uh, we're quite spread out, like a lot of the rural groups are. Now, normally we uh, we would spend um, winter doing a monthly talk um, from September through to April, and then in summer, the idea is to organise events like um, walks, guided walks, and do things uh, like going out looking for birds or uh, plant surveys. Uh, like everybody else this year, we've not done any of those things. Um, but we're hoping that we'll actually get back to, uh, to doing those things as soon as possible. But I think it's probably going to be next season by the look of it. Um, because the size of the group, we don't undertake any major uh, practical work and we don't have any reserves in our area either. But what we have been doing for a few years is clearing Himalayan balsam from along the River Teeth, which has been quite successful. And also we get a lot of individuals who work, our members work within various groups like um, Saving Scotland's Red Squirrels, because we actually are in an area, we've got reds and greys, so we're one of the frontier lines, which is quite important to, uh, to keep that uh, healthy. Um, so plant surveys, uh, bird surveys, and also we try to coordinate with other local conservation groups in our area. Uh, so because we're in the National Park, there is the National Park Authority. 
we're also surrounded by forestry, so we can work with Forest and Land Scotland. And at the moment, we're a partner and a board member of a big project that's lottery funded or HLF funded. Um, but it is actually called Calendars Landscape that is actually doing quite a lot of restoration. The overall theme is actually to make this area more interesting and get visitors more because we're able to visit a town, but also to improve the landscape as um, so it's some legacy there. And um, we are involved in some wet meadow uh, restoration, which is pretty rare habitat. Um, and that's trying to be improved by doing mowing and grazing there. So we're doing the surveys to find out if we've got improvements in the, the plant life. It would have happened this year, but hopefully next year we'll also be able to do things like a bio blitz uh, to find out whether the insect life is improving and how much is actually there. But a lot of that, I say, is in, the, in conjunction with Calvin's landscape because we're a bit too small to undertake these projects completely on our own. So moving on to introducing Tom, um, every year within our programme, we do try and include a local topic, a local speaker. And this is Tom, <laughs> he's our local speaker. Even though he belongs to the Sterling Group, we still let him in. <laughs> Actually, no, I don't think he do, I think he's ours because he's just on the edge of Dune and Blaine. So Tom and his family run um, the Argosy Red Kite Project based on Larrick's Farm, which is just outside Dune, on the Braes of Dune. And in 1996, or between 1996 and 2001, uh, Scottish Natural Heritage, as it was then, and RSPB, uh, released Red Kites. And that is now what Argosy is best known for, is actually for Red Kites, hence the name. And it's the only Red Kite feeding station in central Scotland. So it's a place where you can get really close up views of red kites, as Tom will show you in his presentation. Um, in 2018, the project won the RSPB Nature Tourism Award um, at the Nature of Scotland Awards, which is pretty prestigious. Um, but they also appeared on Landwood. So, you know, it's, it's almost as good. <laughs> um, although it's still called Argoty Red Kites, you'll see tonight that uh, under Tom's stewardship and his family, they've widened the conservation efforts. So it's far more than just red kites. In fact, in the title, we've got red kites, red squirrels and dragonflies. I think you're about to see it's still a lot more than that as well. So we'll just hand over to Tom to carry on and entrance you all with his pictures. Okay, thanks so much, Leslie. Folks, I'm just gonna set the screen on share now. Um, let me just see that this works. Yeah, give me two seconds. That's why I get this going. Sorry, how unprofessional. Here we go. Okay, sorry folks, not the best start. From the beginning, there we go. Folks, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me along tonight, Leslie, and thank you to everyone else for tuning in. I'm sorry we aren't able to meet up in person, but it's lovely to, to be able to talk to you tonight. Tonight, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my home, Argenty, and about some of the conservation work that we do on the estate. So it's conservation of red kites, of course, red squirrels, dragonflies, and much more. First of all, what and where is Argoty? So Leslie gave a bit of a clue about this, but just to put it on the map for you, Argoty is just between Dune and Dunblane, you'll see it here, right in the middle of Scotland. So about an hour north of Edinburgh and Glasgow, about 20 minutes drive north of Stirling. It's a 1,400-acre sheep and beef farm, which my parents and I run together. And we have two aims, really, with the estate. The first is to try and produce food as sustainably as possible. But we also try our best to look after the natural environment here as well. And this picture and the one that follows probably give a good idea of um, some of the things we do. Over the winter months, we'll have our cows up on the hill where they'll be eating grasses, trampling down rushes, and we'll take them off the hill in time for spring, just in time for this beautiful crop of early purple orchids to come up. 
Now the cows are the orchid's best allies in this. They're getting rid of all the competing vegetation and also eating up the seed heads at the moment with all the decaying seeds and spreading them out through their manure. So it's really thanks to the cows that we have this amazing crop that comes up every springtime. Other things we do on the estate, we've got an awful lot of woodland here. So about a fifth of our agate is woodland joined up by, as you can see in this picture, long hedgerow corridors and plenty of scrubby birch as well that we just let come up and thin out. We've got wildflower meadows. We do a fair bit of rewilding as well as the, I suppose you might call more top-down managed conservation. So this is the near end of the hill here, which as you can imagine in the springtime freely rings out the sound of birdsong. It smells incredible as well. And we've got 16 ponds on the place as well. Folks, I'm not going to say too much tonight about, uh, too much more I should say about how we run the place. Some of you might know that uh, at the start of December, I'm doing another talk to the SWT about nature friendly farming here. So I don't want to have too much crossover between now and then. But just to wrap this part of the talk up, I was at a course recently where someone said something that really, really kind of rang home to me which was that it's okay to talk about what you do and how you do it, but what so few people do and what's most important is to say a bit about why you do it. And I'm going to try and do that tonight. So really just to wrap this part up, why do we try and run this place with nature in mind? The two reasons really. The first is that we enjoy it. We like being surrounded by wildlife. It's a passion for us, for me and for my parents. But the second one, and perhaps the most important one, is that it kind of feels as if it's a bit of a duty for us. We know that over 70% of Scotland is farmland, and we know that nature is struggling really badly in Scotland. So it's really kind of it strikes me that if we're going to solve some of these problems, if we're going to mitigate against the worst of the troubles, then really it has to be on farmland that good things happen. We feel like we're in a position where we're very fortunate to have this land. We want to try and put it to good use. So that's our why for why we're running a place like this. Now, as Leslie mentioned earlier, we're perhaps most well known for our red kite project. Now, red kites are Britain's fourth biggest bird of prey after white-tailed eagles, golden eagles, and ospreys. And although I am biased, I do think they are our most beautiful bird as well. We're really lucky to have these birds here because we weren't part of the plan for this at all. Um, I'll come back to that in a second, but just to give you a little bit of the history of red kites, I know some of the people watching tonight will know quite a lot about this, so I don't want to tell people things they already know. I'll just give you a part of history of what happened with these birds. So kites used to be our most common bird of prey that we would find in Britain. You would find them in the towns and cities and also in the countryside as well. But unfortunately, by the 1870s in England and the early 20th century in Scotland, kites have been wiped out. And sadly, this was largely when game shooting became big business. Um, a lot of people saw these big birds flying around and put two and two together and made five and just thought that they must be a danger. Worried that they were going to come down and take all the game birds. A lot of killing was done after the Highland clearances when sheep farming became a big business as well. And the real sadness of this is that kites were wiped out based on a total misconception about their nature and about their abilities. Although they've got a five foot wingspan, these birds, the females might weigh up to about 1.2 kilos. The males will be about 850 grams to a kilo. So they're not big birds at all. The sort of things they come and hunt that they're able to come and take would be things like insects, rodents, amphibians. Maybe a female might be able to take a newly born rabbit, something about that size, but it'd be very, very rare. More than anything else, these birds are scavenging, but sadly people didn't realize that and they wiped them out. And some of the records that we do know of paint a really, really grim picture. So the closest one to here um, in the Calendar Hills, just above Argety, in one year, their gamekeepers put out a dead pony carcass laced with poison and they killed 105 kites. And to give you an idea of, of what that means by today's numbers, we know that we've got 100 breeding pairs of kites across all of central Scotland. 
and we consider that to be really successful. But imagine back then, keepers in one small area wiped out half that number in one year. It gives you an idea of how much we once had in this country and how much we've subsequently lost. So after the last kites were wiped out in Scotland, the only place you would find these birds at all in Britain was a very small number marooned in the Welsh Valleys. Very vulnerable population. They're uh, big problems with inbreeding, people still killing them off. And although people got their act together, the conservationists in Wales managed to save those last pairs. They were never likely to spread out in the rest of Britain without a little bit of help. So in 1989, Roy Dennis pitched on the right here for the RSPB, began bringing red kites back into Scotland and England, bringing over chicks from Scandinavia, flown over by RAF, and releasing them into the wild in two sites. One was the Black Isle outside of Inverness, and the other was Chilton Hills now south. Now these birds, as they were brought over, kept in aviaries from that point, taken at about four weeks old, and they were kept while they grew, fed in the aviaries, wing tagged and leg ringed, and eventually at about seven to eight weeks old, when they'd be big enough to fledge nest if they'd been left in their home countries, they were let go fly free. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we weren't supposed to be part of this red kite reintroduction story. We knew nothing about the fact that the RSPB had picked for their second Scottish site, uh, the Dune area, in fact, the two estates just to the west of us. The first we knew about it was when these big birds came and started circling over the farm. And the dad saw them one day, thought there must be kites because he'd seen black kites before. Um, knew that they weren't black kites because they're more of a southern hemisphere bird, but thought, well, they couldn't be red kites because we don't have any red kites in this area. So we contacted the RSPB, were admitted into this small circle of trust and became really, I suppose, in a way, part of the team. The RSPB were coming out every day onto Argety, feeding the birds, and they'd come to the door and they'd take us out. I was 12 years old at the time, and um, we'd go and watch them. But along with the birds, the next unexpected visitors were people themselves. Now, this was really back before the internet was much of a thing, and somehow the word just spread that kites were on Argety, and we would be coming home from school, and it was a bit like a vehicle version of the Marie Celeste. You'd just see a car abandoned at the side of the road with nobody anywhere nearby. And we realized that the word must be out, that the kites were here. So my parents faced a bit of a dilemma. What do you do? Do you try and keep these birds secret? Or do you let people in, let people come and see them? And they chose the latter, which is a decision that I've always been really, really proud of them for. So they built a viewing hive and started inviting people to come in to see the birds and putting out a small amount of food each day, just enough to top up what they would find in the wild. Not so much that they would become tame, that we would be holding the whole population here and stuff and spreading, but just enough that there was a safe amount. People sometimes ask why feed kites at all? And our answer to that is that it's not what you feed, or it's not whether you feed, it's how much you feed. But the reason for feeding them at all is that kites are scavengers. And if they don't come and feed here, where do they go? Where do people produce carrion for them? You're talking about busy roads, shipping estates, wind farms, train tracks, all places with their own inherent dangers. So we would rather be providing a small amount to top up what they find in the wild than have all of them going there and running the gauntlet. So to this day, we still invite people onto the estate to come to our hides where a ranger would be on duty to tell people about the kite's history. We put the food out and we watch as the birds die. And it's a really spectacular show. These birds are wonderful. Um, when you see them in numbers like this, it's impossible to ever believe that they were absent from Scotland, far less in most of our lifetimes. They put on a great show. What they do, they come swooping down from way up high, they come take meat, fly off, and eat it on the wing. It's a great, great show. At the moment, I should say, folks, that we are still open, obviously, subject to the current coronavirus restrictions. We're doing our tours, our main tours, outside rather than in the main hive with social distancing in place and, um, and just hiring out our 
red kite photography hired as a private hire just for social bubbles. But it's a great show, as I say. Each time of year is very different, and this time in the autumn is one of the most special times. So we've gone through the nesting season, which is a very, very intense period where we might not have that many kites. It might only be five to ten birds coming in, just the ones that are nesting locally, and the rest of them will spread out to their own nesting sites. They're nesting now up to about 70 miles away from here. They're doing really, really well. And um, yeah, so that period, we don't have the huge numbers in the spring and summer, but with hungry beaks to feed, these birds have reached full size, five foot wingspan by seven or eight weeks after hatching. So we can imagine they need an awful lot of food in that period. So practically the diving will be a shoulder to get food. But now things have calmed down a bit and we're into a special period where we're getting growing numbers of kites and they're coming in for the winter roost. Now, autumn is quite an interesting time for these birds. Kites are quite an unusual bird of prey. I think a lot of us think of birds of prey as kind of lone wolf figures, very solitary, territorial, but kites defy all that. They're very much a social bird. And in the autumn, what they do is they come into these big communal roosts, which is where young birds will find a partner and pair up in preparation for the following spring. Any older ones that have lost their partner over the year might come and meet a new partner as well. So I was going to think of it a bit like a raptor nightclub. And yeah, we're getting now in the region of, I think our highest roost count this year was 49 kites. But last year, when the weather got severe, we got up to 60. Winter is probably the most trying time for red kites. A lot of our young birds won't make it through their first winter, which I suppose in a way is a bit of a downside of our feeding policy is that because they're not tame, some of them do have to take their chance in the wild and we can't keep them all going. But we do think it's natural. Our food supply is trying to replicate what might have been found in the wild in olden days when farmers used to leave out carrying for, for the birds. Nowadays, since foot and mouth, everything that dies on the farm can't even be buried. It has to be taken away and incinerated to stop the spread of disease. Which is all good and well. Um, doesn't particularly work in the hill farms anywhere north of here because you never really see a farmer dragging a sheep carcass off the hill. Um, you know, half the time they wouldn't even find them before the wildlife got to them. But the difficulty, I suppose, is with this rule that there's not that much carrying around for scavenging birds. So kites struggle. I don't think it's a surprise that sea eagles are quite often predating lambs because they don't have that supply of food around. So that's what we're trying to do. We are trying very much to replicate that. Now, I've said a few things about our whys. Why do we feed them? But another reason for this, another why for why do this at all? Why have the kites here? Which is very much the same for me as it was for my parents, I think, was that we really, our main reason for doing this project is that we want to protect these birds. They're so vulnerable, they're so easily wiped out, and history has shown that with the numbers that were killed off. They're very much dependent upon people because they're scavengers, because they're unafraid of people, because so much of their food comes from us. That does mean that we have a lot of power over these birds, and the history could so very easily repeat itself. When my parents first set up the project, a lot of the original birds that were brought over from Germany and released into the wild, a lot of those early birds were killed off. And sadly, we still do have a problem with people killing off red kites. So one of our big reasons for doing this is really we want to put these birds in front of people and say, look at them, they're magnificent. Look at the show they've got on. Isn't it a great thing to have these birds back? And they are so special. And we want people to care about them because we hope that if they do, we might be able to do a little bit to combat the killing and try and make things a bit better for them. Now, besides, oops, sorry. besides this aspect of the work, we also do a lot of raptor monitoring on, this, on the estate. These are a couple of red kite chicks that we ringed last year. You'll maybe be able to see with this bird that's standing up, it's got a coloured leg ring on it, plastic coloured leg ring. We do this for the Scottish Raptor Monitoring Scheme and all of our records go to the BTO. Um, very important part of the work. It's a thrilling, challenging, difficult time of the year for us. We have to go out across the estate, try and find all the 
kite nests, everything else before the trees come into leaf, because after that, looking up into the top of a beech tree or a sycamore tree or something that gets very leafy, it can be really, really hard to see the nests that are up there. So we try and find the nests and we hope to God that they don't, the pair don't move from there. So on the estate, we're monitoring red kites, barn owls, tawny owls as well, and most recently long-eared owls, kestrels as well. We've had a big nest box project recently trying to expand the available territory for kestrels because, as I'm sure you all know, their numbers are really, really plummeting in Scotland. And again, largely a lot of this sadly seems to be tied to agriculture. There might be a bit of a case as well for growing numbers of other birds. So um, things like goshawk, buzzards, things that might predate the kestrels. And we've had good success with this project. This is one of the chicks that we ringed this year. We had um, three successful nests on, on the place this year, which is up from one last year. So that has been really, really pleasing. And the other big thrill for us this year and last year, the first time last year, we had a successful osprey nest on the place. Osprey's nesting in the platform that our old head ranger, Mike, built here, artificial one at the top of the tree. Now, this ringing work that we do, Again, it's something that maybe is, some people take a bit of an issue with taking these birds out of the nest and dealing with them. Why do we do it? Without ringing, we would know so little about these birds, about their lives, where they go, what they're capable of doing. And because of that, we would know so much less about ways to protect them. Um, so pretty much everything we know, I think, about about the distances these birds will travel, what will happen in their lives is coming from this ringing project. It gives us an idea as well with numbers of how well each species is faring. For the raptor monitoring scheme, it's one of the biggest citizen science projects in Britain today, one of the one of the biggest, and it's really important, I think, just to give us an idea. I think um, with a lot of the recent nature reports, we would have no idea how badly nature was doing if it wasn't for this ongoing monitoring work. We're all trained in how to do it, and um, you have to have a license to be able to approach these nests. So, you know, it, it's very much a, a, a proper scientific process that we do, and it's important to us just to keep track of these things and try and help out. Now, besides raptor work, the other big love that I have and my parents have is for a new income on Argosy. Again, like red kites, it was an animal that was absent for much of my childhood, which has only made a comeback very recently. So my other love is red squirrels. Now, Argosy used to be grey squirrel only. For the longest time, greys had the run of this place, as with most of the local area. And that was the case until back around 2012, when our former head ranger signed us up for the forestry grant scheme. And we started doing red squirrel and gray squirrel monitoring. Now, this is something that we didn't used to talk about in too much detail, but more and more, I think it's important just to be completely honest with people about it. We're maybe in a fortunate position that being our own bosses, you know, we're not bound by any conditions, we, we don't have to worry about upsetting um, members in the same way that charities might have to. So we can be a bit more honest about it and say that really with grey squirrels in the area, you won't have reds. That was very much our experience. Most of you will know that um, the greys are the non-native species and they were, in, they were introduced to Britain. When red squirrels, to be fair, were already at a bit of a low ebb, we'd removed so much of their woodland cover we had culled them, and that squirrel culls went on right into the start of the 20th century, where we're still killing thousands of them. Ironically, given how much woodland people removed, squirrels were being culled because people thought they were a menace to woodland plantations. So they were already at a low ebb, but from the 1870s, people started bringing over North American grey squirrels and releasing them into the wild, and they have spread through Britain at the rate of knots. So now there's only a few places in England that um, red squirrels still remain and much of central and lowland Scotland 
that's already been lost as well from them. Now, we we don't have anything against grey squirrels at all. You know, nothing upsets me more than having to cull any wild animal. But the truth of it is that with the greys here, they're always going to be a threat to the reds. And where we are in Scotland, we're very much the dividing line between the reds south, uh, the reds the northwest, and the greys the south. Um, most of you will know the reasons for these problems, but just to outline them, the greys are bigger and more aggressive than the reds. They're also more adaptable eaters, so they can bully the reds out of the territory. They can eat acorns when they're green, whereas the reds have to wait for them to ripen to eat. So those two things combined mean that really the reds are pushed out of their homes and left to starve. The other problem is that the greys carry the squirrel pox virus, which they're immune to. Not every grey has it, there's still a lot we have to learn about it, but greys are immune to it and it's fatal to the reds. So for those of you old enough to remember myxomatosis, it's very much like that for the reds. It's a slow, painful death over a couple of weeks where they just dwindle away, they lose fur, they get disoriented, they lose weight. It's a horrible way to go. And although a lot of people do have issue with killing grey squirrels, largely on animal welfare grounds, I think to trap and quickly shoot a grey squirrel is a far better option on these grounds than, than to let the do nothing and let the reds either be pushed out and left to starve or to die of the pox. I think if we're talking animal welfare, then there's a big, big argument to be had there. And that's part of the reason why we do this. So to tell you a bit about our red squirrel work, Mike, our old ranger, as I say, signed us up for this trapping scheme. And over a five year period, he called quite a lot of great squirrels on Arctic. Now, we had no real idea of how successful his work had been and what the, the positive upside of this would be. First, I really knew about it was in my garden one day, this little vandal came in. Now, for weeks after moving back to the farm, I had been feeding the birds. This is just a standard mesh bird feeder. And the nuts went down every two or three days, something like that. And then suddenly they just started disappearing. I couldn't understand what was going on. And I went out one time and I went to fill up the feeder and the one feeder went and jagged me in the hand. And I realized that one of the wires had been wrenched loose. So I thought that was odd, what kind of bird did that? And went to fill up the next day because it had been drained again. And sure enough, another wire was loose. And eventually the thing ended up looking a bit more like an exploded hedgehog than a bird feeder. And I finally caught this wee guy in. Instead of using one of the holes he'd already made in the feeder, he started tearing more shreds out of it. And we realized that we had some red squirrels back here. Uh, my wife said that we weren't allowed to build a red squirrel hide in the garden, which I still don't understand. Baffling why she wouldn't want that. So I started looking around on the estate to see if I could find squirrels in other woods here building feeder boxes and putting out these wee stealth cameras that take images of anything that passed before them and just seeing what it was about. And this is the first ever picture I managed to get for Red Squirrel on one of my feeder boxes at Hardy. Um The reason for doing this, I suppose, um, initially, you know, it wasn't so much about the idea of um, trying to promote the red grey issue and try and kind of spread that information. Really more initially for me, I'd just given up farming and we contracted out the uh, livestock management here to a local couple. And I was thinking, you know, what can I do to try and make the kites a bit of a bigger business, get some more people in, get more people interested in them and what we're doing, and maybe just try and do a bit more good for some of the wildlife here. So that was our reason for kind of getting going with that. And this was our first picture. The Reds became quite regular visitors to this woods. But it wasn't the best wood for it. It was a very close packed conifer plantation, not a lot of light, not great for taking people into. So I cast the net a bit wider and eventually found this lovely spot further down on the estate. And this is the first proper photo ever taken of a red squirrel on Argosy. 
um, taken by my friend Fiona in the sites that we now have our first, first of two, soon to be three red squirrel hides. So once I found the squirrels down there and I'd um, used my exploded hedgehog bird feeder to bring them in, we started getting them in regularly, getting really good numbers, sometimes as many as five or six coming in at the same time. With them, a whole host of other amazing wildlife down there. Being squirrels, tree creepers, woodpeckers, long-tailed tits, nut hatches with mice, so much more. The occasional deer coming in, fine martens at night as well. Really just so amazing how much is there when you sit and have a look. And so we opened up our hide in May of 2000. 2018. That was the first one. We now have a smaller photography hide as well, which is great for all these birds, but the real stars of the show still are squirrels, which are capable of some incredible acrobatics. With our new hide, we were really, really keen to try and um, see exactly what these things were capable of. And so we built a couple of perches, scaffolding poles, to see how far these these guys could jump. And the squirrels bamboozled us so many times with this, proving that they could jump quite easily two meters from the ground up to the platform, that they could wreck our best defenses to stop them from just climbing up to a scaffolding pole. We figured with a scaffolding pole, there's no way they'd be able to climb up fat and grip on with their claws. They'd just slide down. But sure enough, if there's hazelnuts on the top and they smell them, they'll find a way and they very cleverly managed to climb up. Instead of using their claws, they used the, well, I suppose technically it'd be the palms of their paws and just kind of shuffle their way up. So lots of clever things. And we eventually managed to get them to manage to squirrel proof them. So the only way that they could do it was to do lateral jumps like this. And we're having great fun. Increasing numbers of squirrels coming in now, which is fantastic. And we really, really seem to be boosting the numbers on the estate, which is really, really pleasing. Um, Helped a bit by doing some releases with the SSPCA of some orphaned rehab squirrels as well. And we've noticed a real change in their behaviour from the early days when they used to be really very afraid of us when we went down there. I think we were very much an unknown entity. But that's not the case now, as the next picture will show you. <laughs> so this is one of many of them that will come in if they smell any nuts that we've left in our hides. In fact, recently, one of our photographers had to be very quick he was trying to take a photo on his phone of one of them coming in in front of him like this. And he suddenly heard a rustling sound behind him. He realised another squirrel would come running in unbeknownst to him and was trying to steal his pack lunch. So we've seen a real change in them and um, they very much seem to be accepting of people down there now and realising that we're not a threat, which is good. Um, the wider positive of the squirrel work that we're doing and that the neighbouring estates are doing as well, I have to give them a huge amount of credit as well, is that we are creating a real band of red squirrel territory here and hopefully pushing the greys out and south from here. And so now they're being seen in the local villages, probably for the first time in decades anyway, you know, maybe about so 40 years, I would guess. Um, that they're starting to turn up there. I followed one down the road in Doom the other day and it ran into the park. Just amazing. You know, it does, although we aren't happy about having to kill greys, although we hope that there will be a sterilization vaccine or something, some other means that doesn't involve lethal control, um, it does show the upside of doing this work. So, our next project, because two squirrel hides obviously just aren't enough. We're busy at work building a new, bigger hide. That's me and there's one of our volunteers, Sandra. This is us at work on the new hide. Um, and the aim with this really, for our other two hides, they're very much for photographers. And that, I suppose, is how we make the money to do some of this work, is that photography pays you a bit more of a premium and it allows you to do some of the other stuff that maybe doesn't pay quite so much. but in a lot of ways, I suppose, is more worthy and more what we're interested in doing. So with this hide that we're building, the aim is to just be doing daily squirrel tours, which we can do before red kite feeding time. So people, if they want to come for a whole afternoon of wildlife watching, they can come up, see some squirrels, learn about 
their history, learn their story, learn some amazing things about their behavior, see them in the wild, and then can go and do the exact same for the red kites. And more than anything else, of course, what we're trying to do is teach people a little bit about some of the problems that squirrels are facing. So once that's done, and once the world gets back to some kind of normality where we're able to do these things safely, then we'll hope to open up to the public. How are we doing for time, folks? Quick check. Cool. Okay, so besides kites and squirrels, I promise you some other wildlife. A recent thing that we've been very, very proud of here is the number of songbirds that we have here. Now, we also have an awful lot of buzzards. We obviously have kites. And I think a lot of people would have you believe that if you had those birds, you could have a real decline in songbirds. But I hope that we've been able to show that that's actually not the case. The bird that we're perhaps most proud of is this one here, the tree sparrow. Now, when I was a kid, I don't really remember seeing many tree sparrows on Arctic, but things have changed a lot since we opened up the kite project. We did a lot of work with the local RSPB members group, and they made the very sensible point when we built our hide, my parents, that what happens if you have a day where the kites just aren't performing? What are you going to use to distract people with? What about planting up this big empty field around the hide with some good hawthorns, hazels, rowans, things that are going to make good shelter and food for small birds as well. So that's what they did. And the result, pleasingly, has been a massive, massive upsurge in our songbird population, particularly these tree sparrows. In conjunction with um, their growing numbers, we started up a big nest box project here over the last couple of years where we've built and installed all along the fence line from our car park area up to our hide, all these wee boxes. And the uptake on them has really, really been staggering. So I think now we must have about 100 boxes up there. Last year, we only had about 30, but most of them were used, which was really, really pleasing. Tree sparrows are such a communal bird, so if you can get them going in one, then the odds are pretty good that you'll get them in more. And this really, it doesn't sound like much, I know, with um, an S-Box project, something anyone could do and that everyone should do. The idea I had with this, the reason why we're trying to do this is that it strikes me more and more that what we ought to be doing as landowners, conservationists, what have you, is to try and connect habitat as much as we can. So as well as having a whole load of nest boxes, imitating mature woodland that isn't there yet in this spot, we've also been planting loads of buddleia. The wildflower meadows have come on the back of this as well. The overall aim for the estate, I suppose, is that eventually all the habitats here will be linked. I heard it said once that one of the big problems that we have in Britain is because we've got rid of so much habitat, say if you've got a block of woodland and you've got another one a quarter of a mile away, the wildlife in those blocks are effectively trapped in there. There's no way that they can have safe passage between the two. So I suppose in a way it can be little wonder that um, predators do take the smaller things. So this is something we're looking to see if we can tackle a wee bit in this as part of our project with that. We also, as well as the tree sparrows, we have a lot of other songbirds as well. Tits, finches, loads of things coming in, woodpeckers, even now, um, red squirrels coming in, coming through some of the downy woodland around and the young, young, um, young trees that are coming in. And the red squirrels are chancing up the young tree coming in, but I mean, I think it's really, really pleasing. So besides the songbird, bird, and I should say, by the way, we've just opened up a new songbird hive as well. People to come and see these things. Besides that, another thing that we've started up in the last couple of years is doing nature walks. And in a normal year, we'll be doing evening talks as well. And obviously, that's all had to go online just now, but we are doing Zoom talks a bit similar to this, um, getting speakers in and coming and doing talks about conservation and issues that we're passionate about. But nature walks have been one of our big things that we've really kind of gone into in the last couple of years. And our main excitement has been dragonflies and damselflies. If I use the term dragonfly, by the way, folks, 
and really just kind of using it interchangeably to refer to dragonflies and damselflies as being lazy about it. But we, what I knew about dragonflies until about a year and a half ago, you could have written on the head of a pin. Um, I knew that we had quite a lot of them here, but trying to tell the difference between any of them would have been well beyond me. I'll just go back a slide and tell you a wee bit about the man. And it was really, I don't know if you can all see this man here. This is Rory Mackenzie Dodds, who was one of the people that really got us passionate about dragonflies. So through a friend, we met Rory and his lovely wife, Terry, who are probably the dragonfly experts in Britain. They set up the first ever British dragonfly sanctuary and they dedicate their whole lives to these amazing insects. And Rory agreed to come out and do some dragonfly walks here and um, teach everyone about it. And after he'd done a couple, he told me that one of his aims now was to try and pass the baton on to younger people, try and get more people involved in dragonflies, interested in their current inspiration. And he very kindly, he and Curry agreed that they would train us up and teach me and some of our rangers a bit so we could run walks of our own. Now, as I say, I knew that we had dragonflies here, but I had no idea how many we had. The further away from the equator you are, dragonflies tend to prefer heat. The further away from the equator, the less dragonfly species you'll have. But of the 12 species you could have in this part of Scotland, we have all 12 of them. And they're glorious to watch. This is one of my favourite pictures that's been taken. Um, what I like about, about dragonflies is two things, really. One is that the geek in me, I think it's pretty cool to have a species still here now that's been around since the time of dinosaurs. That just blows my mind. And for those of you that don't know, apparently dragonflies back then used to have a wingspan of about 60 to 70 centimetres. Um, air density was different then, so they needed them just to be able to paddle through the air, apparently. But that blows my mind. But the other thing, again, it really speaks to the geek in me, but what I really, really like about these insects is the same thing that I like about raptors, really. It's their ability to do things that we're not capable of. So you have these flying teeth, <laughs> in the case of dragonflies, these beautiful flying jewels that fly around eating things and mating their whole life above water. Most of their life, incidentally, is spent underwater. But the whole time that they're above water, it's just frantic where they're eating, they're trying to procreate, just trying to continue the species. And when you get a hot sunny day and we're out doing one of our dragonfly walks here, it's just incredible. The way that they move, you know, going 30 meters in a split second, they've gone, it's a bit of breeze, they decide to take off from one side of the pond to the other and they're away. Really, really amazing stuff. So these insects, they do really, really speak to the boffin in me. And I love having them here. It's one of the real thrills of reaching the summer months and being able to do these dragonfly walks now. I'm seeing some of the amazing species that we have here. Besides dragonflies, once we started getting geeky about insects, there was no point turning back. So we've got a moth trap and we're starting doing moth trapping events as well. Now, my knowledge of them, again, I'm really at the beginning of my journey of trying to learn about them. But even just to be able to trap these things and see them close up is really mind blowing. We got the trap quite late on in the trapping season this year. But we'll be looking to try and do a lot more of it next year, maybe trying to do some photography workshops. If I can learn enough about them, then hopefully we'll try and open them up as kind of general public ones as well, rather than just things that people can point their camera at. But it's been incredible to see these things close up. When you do, it really debunks the idea that it's moths are boring brown insect spectacular. Now, in the winter of 2018, a bit short of jobs to do, and with a lot of volunteers that were looking for work, we started on an absolute monster of a construction job. This patch of rough ground outside our car park area had been doing nothing for years. And it looked an absolute fright when people were coming here. So I started looking to see what we might do. And thanks again to Rory Mackenzie Dodds and Curry to Kunitswater, his wife. I got this inspiration. So they had set up a raised bed pond down at Wicking Fen in England and started doing dragonfly 
tourists from there. So basically, it's just safer as around the outside, a liner of water and plants on the inside. And we set to work in what was probably the worst weather you could possibly try and build something in. But we got the pond built. Oh, if it had been like that when we were building. It's about 15 foot square. And now in the summer months, every Wednesday, our lovely volunteer Sandra and I, we do these pond dipping events where we take people out. And we explore what's in the pond and all the amazing life that's in there. They're really, really fun. We do enjoy them. And again, I suppose uh, with these insects, it's not something I would have ever imagined myself being interested in. I think probably I'm quite like a lot of other people in that, that insects for a long time to me were just insects. And then you start to learn a bit more about them and about what's going on in these underwater kingdoms here. You've got a whole food chain going on down there, all these little monsters that are eating each other. And it's fascinating some of the things you come out with, some of the things you see. The other thing I think that really kind of speaks to me about this is having built this pond, just the magic of things finding their way here, which they did so quickly. Within a couple of days of having it filled, the thing was being colonized by water boatmen, pond skaters, newts, frogs. And eventually, our main aim with this has been to try and get dragonflies to come in. And eventually they did come. And to date, we had five species of dragon or damselfly breeding in there, which has been really, really pleasing. So if we get another good summer next year and the weather's kind for them, then hopefully we'll get a few more of them visiting on our pond dipping session. We also use it for our photography workshops as well, which allows us to get up close to some of the other species that would be really hard to find. We have a lot of fun with this. With this again, it's very much our why for the ponds. We know how much wetland has been lost in Britain with drainage improvements in agriculture and such like. Remove the wood beavers as well would be a big reason for that, I guess. And we just want to try and do our best with it. We want to try and make a home for wildlife. If we can make a business from it, all the better. And, um, you know, we are, we are slowly and steadily getting more people coming through the doors, coming to see these things and learn about these things. And with a pond, I guess nobody can be expected to build something quite as big as the one that we've got out there unless they've got an absolute football pitch for a garden but we hope that we've sent people away understanding a bit more about the importance of insects how crucial they are to the food chain how interesting they are maybe people will think about building even small ponds in their garden and trying to attract things in and seeing what wildlife comes from there so that's our big drive with that with the sessions and that's why we've done that um, folks, I don't have a huge amount more to tell you about tonight, but I hope very much that we'll be able to see you sometime soon. As I said, we are, we're in tier three at the moment, so traveling to this area, unless you live in the Sterling area, is difficult. But if you do and you're looking for a day out in, in the fresh air or looking to hire the photography hides, they are open, we are open for business and, um, we do hope to see people out here. It's a great time to see the squirrels, which are busy burning nuts for winter. Great time to see the kites gathering in a big numbers for the winter, which they going to their food each day. So we do hope we'll see you for one of these things soon. And hopefully, for those of you out with the area, you might wish to come and see these things when the world returns to some degree of normality. As I say, everything will be, I hope, all these open door uh, outdoor events will be back up and running again next year, all being well. And everything will be advertised as normal on our social media channels. So our main one is Facebook. It's the only one that a man my age can understand, really. But we do advertise a little bit on Twitter and Instagram as well. Or you can visit our website there as well and give us a call. And yeah, we hope very much to see you sometime soon. Thank you very much for inviting me along to speak tonight. Thanks very much, Tom. That was great. There's one person actually typed into the chat. Tom is inspirational. <laughs> that's your best testament, I think. The amazing amount that's been done in Thank the casting. Mike McDonnell, the early days that you mentioned, Mike, of trapping grey squirrels. 
and the amount of things that you've done since then is just incredible. So we've got lots of questions. They do tend to fall into categories of species, really. So first one is, in the Chilterns, red kites have increased so much that active feeding has been stopped. Any comments with respect to Scotland? And that's got a double question. It says, I love red kites, but is there a maximum density? That's a really good question, actually. Um, I think with the Chilterns, it's hard to compare it to Scotland because there are so many people down there that um, kites aren't probably actually back to the natural level. When you look at the, I hate this term, but vermin totals that keepers used to have, you know, I pointed out one earlier, but I think across Britain, there must have been thousands upon thousands of them. So, you know, the kites aren't actually at an unnatural level. Arguably, it's people down there that have you know, reached that level. We don't have the same number of people here. So I don't see us ever really kind of getting to the point that a scavenger goes out of control. Um, I also think that the point made earlier as well about busy roads, shooting estates, wind farms, train tracks, I think that does have some validity as well because short of stopping all of those things, I don't think, John, that you would ever have kites living in any way kind of independent of people. They are they are scavengers anyway, so you know they're, they're always going to be following us around for our things. So I don't see it really. I also think the other problem really is that we do still have this big problem, particularly with the driven grouse moors where kites are disappearing. So we're nowhere near what our natural level of kites could or should be. Um, will we reach that point? I don't know. I don't see it. I don't see the human population in, in Scotland increasing to the point that, um, that they would kind of get to the level of the children's. So, I don't see it us changing it with our feeding policy, honestly, but when we're putting out the food for the birds, just to give you an idea, we are putting about the weight of a rabbit's worth out into the maximum. And that, this time of year, that could be, you know, sort of 30, 40 kites, crows, buzzards, herons, all sorts of things coming. So it's not really giving any of them a huge amount. It's just, they couldn't survive on that alone, you know. Okay, uh, question is, do kites compete with any other raptors? Um, I think there's probably a bit of competition in some areas with buzzards. There's been a lot of that. Actually, interesting, again, John mentioning the Chilterns. Um, I think there's been a bit of displacement there with increasing numbers of kites and buzzards maybe being displaced a bit, which, again, has created a little bit of controversy down there. People are a bit unhappy about Types and the numbers they have. Um, still, the entire global kite population is only half of the UK's buzzard population. So that would argue to me that any displacement is very localised. There's probably a little bit of competition, I guess, with other smaller birds. You know, maybe kestrels might be having a bit of a hard time more competition for bulls, and a bit as well with corvids. Although, arguably, you know, given the potential effect of corvids on songbirds and things like that, um, maybe bring their numbers a bit more into balance isn't such a bad thing. I think the only thing that really is a threat to kites of the other raptors at the moment um, is goshawk, which are coming more into this area. And um, we've certainly had a few issues with goshawks predating kites. All again, totally natural, though, you know, things that we would expect to happen. Um. I think there are a couple of questions that you've mentioned, but perhaps worth just sort of uh, giving the point again. Where were the original reintroduced birds from? And how, oh, sorry, many, yes. how many breeding pairs of red kites are there in Scotland and the UK? Okay, so um, our kites were brought over from the eastern part of Germany. And um, the various different projects, um, they were brought from different places in Europe. Fortunately, there are lots of places where people hadn't treated the kites as badly as they had in the UK. So Spain, Scandinavia, Germany, they all had good kite populations. So for the early projects, they were mixing up, um, you know, taking birds from separate populations to kickstart them. So we had as big a gene pool as we could. 
one of the pleasing things about the success of Kites in Britain is that now we have so many that we're able to kickstart our own projects just from purely British Kites. So taken from all the different sites in Britain gives us a big enough gene pool, which is really nice. I'd be struggling to tell you the overall British population, but I think in Scotland we must have something in the region of about 350 to 400 breeding pairs. So good numbers for us, really good numbers from Dumfries and Galloway. Aberdeen's population is expanding slowly and surely. One place that probably is still struggling is the original Black Isle population where they were released in 1989. And sadly, the big reason for that seems to be the amount of really intensive grouse shooting estates around that area seems to be limiting their spread and success, unfortunately. Okay, we've got a bit of a history question for you now. <laughs> Why were kites slaughtered after the clearances? That was well before game shooting started. Surely they didn't think kites would take lambs. Well, they actually did, yeah. It's a really good point, so I probably didn't explain that well enough, but you'll read um, a lot of old historical sources that said that kites could come and take even fully grown sheep. Um, where this came from, I don't know. Kites will, in lambing season, come and hover over a lambing field, waiting for the placenta rather than the lamb. Um, maybe they were seen landing on dead lambs, taking them, or scavenging on them, I should say. Um, so maybe that was it. Maybe as well there was a bit of confusion between kites and other, maybe slightly more capable birds. I certainly, there was a bit of confusion between the different names for these birds. So in Scotland, a lot of them were called gleds. Gled came from the Anglo-Saxon word meaning to glide. And you would have kites, buzzards, hen harriers would all in different areas be referred to as clad, so that might suggest there was a bit of confusion about it. Um, generally, I think back then people had so much less knowledge about the capabilities of predators that a lot of things were killed wrongly. Bear in mind that back then as well, people thought that pine martins would kill sheep by biting off their noses and sucking out their brains. <laughs> We've come a long way. <laughs> We've got lots of questions on pine martins, but that wasn't one of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, moving on from kites, uh, the question, I love the red kites, but very interested in the ospreys. Have you just got one pair breeding and have you got a few platforms up to encourage more? We have one pair at the moment. We have another platform up which hasn't been, or two other platforms that haven't been used by ospreys. One of them has actually been stolen in the past by a pair of kites. It was the first time that um, kites ever successfully reared chicks from an osprey platform in Britain. Uh, so a bit of an unusual record that we set there. Um, we will look at probably putting up some more platforms in due course as well. You know, it um, took us six years to get the ospreys to the one that they're breeding in. Uh, so it wasn't by any means a quick thing at all. But um, yeah, it's definitely something that we'll look at over the coming years to see if we can get some more pairs here. Um, we might first try and provide a slightly more regular food source stock of pond with fish because ospreys can breed at high densities, but it's provided that there's enough food for them. So that might be the first step for us. This next question actually makes me come up with this sort of idea of a very dangerous place to be, but will you be building an osprey hive? Um, eventually we may look at it. Um, at the moment we've very much tried to just kind of leave them in peace and let them get breeding seasons under the belt. We were supposed to have an osprey nest camera this year, but unfortunately lockdown kicked in the day that we got the camera ordered, so we weren't able to install that. But that would probably, I think, be our next step is to have the camera put up on the nest. We may then look at maybe doing a hide on the back of that. Part, probably part of our difficulty is that it's just myself, our lovely volunteers, and my mum and dad who are supposed to be taking a step back, although I haven't really let them. Um, so, you know, we do have to kind of consider what we're capable of doing each year. There's a lot of things I'd like to do, but some of them might get a bit daunted next year as a result. 
but hopefully one day we will have an Osprey Hyde. Certainly the next camera will be in place next year. Okay, I guess this could apply to um, any of the birds that you've got on the farm, any of the uh, raptors, but what effect does the Braze of Dune wind farm have? Initially, I think it had a worse impact than it does now. Um, we were losing probably about one bird a year flying into the turbines. Kites are less vulnerable, I think, than a lot of other birds. Um, you know, sparrowhawks, if they lock onto prey, might not see a turbine um, and fly straight into it. The kites don't really do that in the same way. So they're probably a bit less vulnerable. They're also being a bit bigger. They're able to resist being sucked into the vacuum of the blade, which is, I think, what accounts for quite a lot of other smaller birds being killed. It's not that they fly directly in, but they fly too close and get sucked in. I think in the early years, they weren't so active about cleaning up the carrion at the foot of the turbines. So that did draw a few more kites in, but um, now they do that a lot more, so we've had less of an impact. Um, Non-direct effect of the wind farm, quite interestingly, is that we used to get a lot more transparency between our winter roost and the birds that were roosting up in the Creef Comrie area, where there's massive populations, probably drawn there by the amount of pheasant chasing states and the amount of carrion that they leave. With the wind farm in place, we don't see as much of the birds kind of crossing over the border into the Comrie area now. So that's probably been the biggest impact, really. Okay, I think um, we're probably on to red squirrels. <laughs> um, a couple of people asked a question, or several people. Have you considered releasing pine martin to control grey squirrel population? So um, we actually wouldn't need to because we've got an awful lot of pine martins here now. And I think they are probably doing their fair share of, of grey squirrel control around the area. I think um, possibly this question um, is alluding to a slightly bigger topic about uh, about whether pine martins in themselves would be enough to control grey squirrels. There's been a lot in the media about this, and George Monbiot wrote a, an article about it, basically saying why we're we paying landowners to control grey squirrels when we could just let pine martins do it. My experience of it is that I don't think you can expect an omnivore that ranges quite widely in a lot of cases to do all this work with a massive population of gray squirrels on its own. I think in a way that to me, it sounds almost a wee bit like wishful thinking when I read articles like that, that you know, people are, I think understandably, but I think people are quite reluctant to ever consider pulling the trigger to solve problems that people have created. Um, certainly that's what I thought when I read the George Monbiot article. Um, so I think, you know, if people can get the grey squirrel population down, then the pine markers will help you to control them from there. But it does need to be a kind of combination of the two, I think. The questions get bigger as we go down the list, Tom. So you like this one. <laughs> Would you support the reintroduction of links? Scotland. Another one suggests that it would eventually, may eventually help red kites in terms of finding remains of roe deer carcasses. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, the, it's just as well you've got me and not my dad who's probably watching this, um, answering this question, because uh, you might get a slightly different answer. But I would support the reintroduction of links, I think, with one caveat, which is that I think they're necessary. I think our deer population is clearly way too high and we do need to do something about it. Our woodland cover is way too low, particularly largely because of deer. So I think we do need them back. And I don't think that deer fencing really is the answer. You know, all you're doing is fencing deer out and letting them nibble on all vegetation outside of the fence. Um, so, you know, for me, that's not the answer and people are proven very bad at controlling deer. I think we need a natural predator back. They'd also control a lot of foxes, which I think would also have a knock-on effect on things that foxes are predating. Might even keep badgers on the run as well. Again, it's nothing against any of these animals. I like all these animals a lot, but um, in a degraded landscape as we have in Scotland, you can see that these things are causing some problems. 
So I would support it. I think the caveat I would have with it is that we hear a lot about what we need to do with conservation and why we need to do it, but I don't think conservationists are always particularly good at looking at how we do it in terms um, the effect it has on the people whose livelihoods might be impacted. Now, I don't think that links are going to come and take people's sheep here, but most of the example of sheep and woodlands, um, we don't do that here, and in any case, we don't have much woodland to graze the men in Scotland anyway. So I don't see it being a huge problem, but I think we do have to be prepared for, the, for that to happen. Otherwise, you know, you're going to have a lot of farmers that are already upset about other reintroduced species that have been brought in without a plan to kind of deal with problems like eagles, white beavers, etc., which are all great to have back, but I think, you know, we need to just be thinking about our plan for doing it. Would they help red kites? I guess so, yeah. Um, I think the amount of things they kill could conceivably help them. In reality, actually, I'm going to take that back. I don't think there would be a huge impact for kites from lynx thinking about it properly. Lynx are an ambush hunter and they're probably going to be doing most of their killing in the woodland. Kites with their big five foot wingspan are going to struggle to get in to most woodland patches to be able to come and scavenge on things. So probably the impact for kites themselves would be very negligible. I'm willing to be proved wrong on that. I think we're red kites just flicking back to that. Are they likely to move into cities in Scotland like black kites in other countries or foxes in the UK? I think probably not in the short to medium term. They are actually, some of the ones from Dumfries and Galloway have been seen flying over Edinburgh. Um, but I think there's so much green space around that. Um, and until they fill that completely, then they probably won't go back into the urban areas. South of the border, down in the Chilkoons, because they've done so well, because people have been feeding them, and because the human population is so large there, they are actually back in the towns and cities in a lot of places. So that's in the Chilkoons, and also in Yorkshire as well, you'll see kites there. So they've really kind of gone full circle. I think for us it'll take longer than that. Yeah. Just what camera and lens you've used to take your magnificent photos of wildlife? <laughs> now, I should say that I haven't taken any of the photos that you've seen tonight, apart from a few dodgy mobile phone ones, which I skipped past quite quickly. Um, probably easier if I tell you the kind of distances, um, folks, because I'm not a photographer at all. Um, so all the squirrel shots, squirrels will be in within about five metres of the height. Um, for the red kite photos, you're talking of a distance about maybe 35 meters from the height for most of them. So um, probably I'm really going to stretch myself here. For the kite photos, um, you might be talking about a 300 mil lens or something like that, or something smaller with a teleconverter would do that just as well. And obviously it's perfectly suitable for the bigger lenses as well. If people, if we have photographers here that are ready, interested. My mum is the resident photographer here, so please do feel free to get in touch via Facebook and she can answer all these questions and tell me that everything I just told you was rubbish. A mm -hmm. um, couple of final things. Somebody asking if the access road is better than it was last time you came. I think the answer is yes. <laughs> I can carry <laughs> on. <laughs> um, for those of us who are more remote, would you ever consider webcams for red squirrels or kites or osprey at all? Well, the ospreys, as I say, yeah, that's it. That's a banker, yeah. Um, we'll definitely do that. The problem with kites with the webcams, we did look at it, but um, they do hop around quite a lot between nests. So trying to get one that we think will definitely be a banker is tricky, particularly now that we have goshawk back, we have pine martens back. Um, these things do mean that kites will move on quite quickly rather than risk being predated. Um, the other thing as well that's been quite tricky this year is people walking through the woods that has put a few kites off and nests have failed as a result. So 
I don't think we'll be looking at that anytime soon, particularly if COVID restrictions are similar this year to uh, next year to this year, but certainly the Ospreys. Um, with the squirrels, uh, it'd be tricky. We have done a few uh, Facebook live tours with them, showing them off. Um, the problem is they move so quickly that trying to get a camera fixed on them might be kind of hard, um, in all honesty. One thing if people are looking for a squirrel fix is that sometime early next year, we're going to be on the new series of the SSPCA show on the BBC, Born to be Wild, and they'll be a good bit of squirrel footage and otter footage from here on there. So if you're looking for a bit of a wildlife fix and we're not able to travel, hopefully we'll be able to see them there. Okay, I think uh, being aware of time, we've probably given Tom quite a good grilling at this point. I'll just say that somebody was very pleased for the uh, you managed to get the tree sparrows in because you've seen them for the first time in 12 years at Blair Drummond. Um, and the final person's just asked for more golden eagles as well, please. <laughs> Could be a tall order that one. <laughs> okay, well, just to close the meeting down, I'd really like to thank Tom. You can see from all the comments that uh, lots of people have really enjoyed that wonderful talk. You do great work and the sort of comments that are coming in. Uh, and also to say thank you to Rory for the technical support behind this. It's our first one and it's gone, gone okay, I think. It doesn't seem to have dropped out or done anything disastrous. Um, I suspect most of the audience here, and thank you well for, as well for joining in, you're probably already members of the vast majority of the Scottish Wildlife Trust. If you're not, then there's an obvious plea to consider whether you would join and support the excellent work that the SWT does across Scotland. Um, as a, a final um, comment, I would also say, there's been talk about cameras and, and looking at Argety. If you can't get there, you can follow Tom on Facebook and he's been doing fantastic daily posts right from March to keep us all with our heads above water during lockdown and since then. So I highly recommend following him on Facebook. But, um, and the, the last comment I've been asked to make is from the Stirling Group. Tom did mention that his next talk is going to be on Tuesday the 1st of December at 7.30 for the Stirling and Clack Manager Group. Uh, it's a bit like Tom part two. It's actually a different talk with a different emphasis on a combination of nature friendly farming, combining farming with uh, conservation work. So it's a very good linking from this one and I'd highly recommend that one as well. So thanks once again to everybody and hope we see you at more talks in the future. Bye. <laughs>